oral history or interview conducted for the Witness to War Serving a Nation Project at Nonset Regional High School on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. For the sake of this interview, please state your full name and community in which you will now reside. My name is Craig Stephen Field, and I reside in South Yarmouth, Massachusetts. Okay. So, were you drafted or did you enlist in the military? I enlisted in the military. Alright. Um, who most influenced you to enlist? Uh, actually, my father did. Uh, my father was a, a military man. My father uh, was in World War II. He was in the Navy, and when he got out of the Navy, he joined the Army and he went to Korea. And then when he got out of the Army, he joined the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Um, did your, how did your parents feel about you joining? They weren't very happy. They no, I was, uh, I was 17 years old when I joined the Army. Um, can you describe the emotion when you felt when you uh, when I first arrived? In Vietnam. Oh, in Vietnam. Uh, well, I was 18 when I arrived in Vietnam and uh, probably just a few years older than you. So uh, I really wasn't fully aware of what my experience was going to be while I was there. So I was, I was probably very excited at the time to be there. And that changed a little bit as time went on. Um, did you train before going into war, or did you have to go straight there? No, I trained. I spent two months in uh, basic training, where you learn your basic skills to be in the Army. And then from there, I spent two months in something called AIT, which was advanced, advanced individual training. And I was trained to be a heavy equipment operator, uh, bulldozers, bucket loaders, heavy machinery. Probably basic training. It, it's it's pretty difficult. Uh, you know, it's uh, long hours, uh, grueling. Uh, what was some of the stuff that you did there? Uh, uh, you know, you're up early in the morning. Uh, you're carrying heavy 60-pound packs. Uh, you're crawling in the mud. Uh -huh. You don't get any sleep. Uh, you go on 10, 15-mile runs. Uh, it's it, it, they they put you through the. Uh, put you through the whole thing so that when you finally do get to your destination, you're, you're ready to go. Um, who had the greatest impact on you during your service in Vietnam? Uh, probably my drill sergeant, my drill sergeant. He was a, he was a lifetime, he was a career sergeant and uh, he was a good man and he just taught us, you know, pride and uh, camaraderie uh, that everybody sticks together to get the mission done. What was your happiest moment when you were in Vietnam? Coming home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, probably my happiest moment was uh, at the time, remembering I'm old, I was only 18, was uh, going on R&R, &R, which is rest and relaxation. You, During that period that you're there, you get a one-week break, and you can go to different places. Uh, I went to Thailand. So, you know, while I was there, I rented a motorcycle and I traveled around the country to the different beaches and, oh, you know, yeah, so you get to see different kind of, I could have gone to Australia or Japan or things like that. Did do you, like, go with friends? I went with a friend from Vietnam, yeah. Um, can you describe your darkest moment when you were there? Uh, probably... Probably being out on a mission for a couple of weeks, uh, it was something called search and destroy where you're dropped into the jungle and you, you travel through the jungle for a few weeks searching out en the enemy. Uh, and when it was time to be picked up, the last helicopter came in to pick us up and uh, as it was taking off, it was overloaded. So there was another guy and myself, we had to get off and then the helicopter took off. So we, the two of us were left behind. So we were sort of left in the jungle by ourselves, waiting for the next, oh. hoping the next helicopter was going to arrive. In the jungle for? Probably a few hours before it finally arrived. Oh, okay. You know. Um, did anything like scary happen when you were alone in the jungle? By uh, well, it's, you've got to you've got to think about your your situation. You're you're in the jungle, and there there are enemy soldiers. 
in the same jungle that you're in, and now there's only, instead of being a hundred guys, now there's only two. And, you know, so you're all alone. Uh, we, we weren't confronted, thank God. You know, uh, we sort of laid low and tried to stay out of sight, and uh, finally rescue did come. You know, uh, I'm not going to say that was the darkest moment. That was probably a, a scary moment. Uh, there are certain moments that we probably won't talk about, you know, but uh, so it's just things like that, you know, that are, uh, that I remember. Well, what was it like to fight in war? Uh, not really enjoyable. It's, uh, you, you get a, it's, it's like a, like a rush. Uh, and sometimes you react so quickly, you, you know, adrenaline rush that you don't even really, really realize what you're doing. You know, it's just you get caught up in the moment, and uh, then the next thing you know, it's over. So, but, so you were like a group of people? Like yes, you yes. How many of you were there? Uh, sometimes there were uh, 10 or 12 of us. Uh, other times there were uh, 100 of us, depending on the mission that we would go on. Was it a positive experience over there, or? All in all, it was a positive experience. Uh, you know, I learned a lot. I grew up fast. Uh, I would say it was a positive. You know, it took a while for it to become a positive experience. Uh, you guys don't remember, you, but your, I'm not sure your parents remember, but your grandparents remember that when soldiers came home from Vietnam, they weren't welcome. You know, not like today, when soldiers come home, you know, they have parades and, you know, everybody's greeting them at the airport and stuff. When I came home, uh, I called my house, I was in the airport, I called my house, and nobody answered. And so I took a taxi home and I got home and nobody was home. Uh, so that was sort of a, a depressing. And also at that time, there was the, uh, during that, the 60s period, there was a lot of protest against the war and, uh, and soldiers really weren't respected. So you, you know, you didn't talk about it. They were off working or in school, or they didn't realize that I was coming home. You know, what, one one minute you're in in a war, and the next day I was at home. And it's not like today when soldiers come home; they come home as a unit or a group. Back then, when you came home, you came home, you were by yourself. So uh, it was a little different. Um, how long were you like in Vietnam? I was there for a year. Uh, well, you arrive in country, you spend your first, I arrived in Tan Sinh Ut Air Force Base, which is in South, South Vietnam, Saigon, and you spend your first two or three days processing into country, and what they do is they assign you to a unit, uh, and I was assigned to the 1st Infantry Division. And so during that couple of days, uh, once I was processed through, then I was put on a truck and I was driven north to uh, the unit that I was going to serve with for my time that I was going to be there. Uh, leaving is basically the same thing. It's uh, on your last night, wherever you might be, wherever your camp is, uh, you sign out, you get on a truck, they drive you back down south, and you, they process you out, and you get on the plane and you fly home. Did you have any conflict with any people over there, like the enemies? Oh, yeah. There was a lot of times that we'd have, uh, we call them firefights, where you'd be. Uh, what were those like? Uh, they were sp very sporadic. They would, uh, one minute you would be just doing your job or whatever, and the next minute you would be in a, in a firefight, which could last 15 minutes, and then it would be over. So you'd get these sudden ru adrenaline rushes, and then it would stop, and then it would just be quiet again. and then. Uh, you go about your business. Did you have a lot of those? Quite a few, quite a few. My, my main job when I was over there is uh, I went over as a heavy equipment operator, but while I was there, I transferred over to a demolitions expert. So I did uh, demolition work, uh, mine sweep, uh, and also basically blowing things up, uh, sweeping the roads for mines. Like today, they have the uh, 
you hear about the IEDs uh, that these uh, young men in Iraq, you know, they, they blow up these vehicles and stuff. Uh, but my job at that time was to try and find those and detonate them before they could do any damage. Did you actually find any? Oh yeah, yeah, find, found quite a few. And then you would also, being a part of that team, you would go, I mentioned earlier about search and destroy. That's when they would drop us into the jungle and we would go around for a couple of weeks and we would look for the enemy or their, their base camps in the jungle and usually you'd end up having like a firefight and that could take half an hour, a day, a couple of days until you could finally take over their base camp and then what I would do is, and the, and the other guys on my team, we would set up the charges. Uh, we would go down in their bunkers and set up charges and, uh, you know, blow them up and destroy them. Did you, like, take over, like, their camp once you got there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was our mission, to go out and destroy their base camps to uh, keep them on the run. How many of them did you get to? Oh, during the course of the year, probably a dozen or two. What was, like, one of your longest firefights? Uh, probably... Uh, probably a good 24 hours, it probably started midday and it went through the night into the next day and then finally, and during that, that course of that time you, you'll call in uh, air support so you'd have jets coming in and dropping bombs. Uh, so, you know, pretty intense. It would go on, for, sometimes it'd go on for quite a while. What made your experience at war a positive one? Uh, oh, that's a tough one. I would say just the, for me, the positive thing, the thing that I took away from it the most was uh, the camaraderie, the relationship that I had with other men. Uh, you know, you became friends for life, uh, which is very, you know, very important. Do you still keep in touch with any of them? No, actually, uh, I've lost touch with most of them, or they've passed on. So. Could you describe an unforgettable memory that you had when you were in Vietnam? <laughs> well, there's one without getting into too graphic a detail. Uh, you could do that. Yeah, uh, during a mine sweeping uh, time, we, we were sweeping a road and there was a, uh, a small stream running under the road and there was an uh, over the top of a, you know what a culvert is? It's a large metal tube that they put it under the ground to allow the water to flow from one side of the road to the other. Okay, and then they put the road on top of it. But uh, they thought there's a possibility that they could have been a <coughs> pardon me, could have been a uh, a mine inside the culvert, and they needed somebody. Now, remind you, remind I was very young then, so they, without thinking, they asked, "Is anybody here a good swimmer?" And I said, I am, without even thinking. And so I had to strip down to my underwear and go into that water and go underneath the culvert and feel around to see if there was a mine down there, uh, which there wasn't, thank God. But when I came out of the water, I was covered in leeches. Uh, some of them were like eight inches long. I mean, they were just, my whole body was just covered in leeches. So that was sort of a a disturbing experience for me, you know. Uh, I'd rather, I, I'm not going to get into uh, you know graphic details about uh, people dying or anything like that. I, I'm not sure that's something you, you know, it's nothing worth talking about. I mean, we're all well aware of what happens in war, but uh, little things like that that I remember, you know. People ripped them off of me. Yeah. <laughs> I'd never experienced anything like that there. So that was sort of a, a shocking experience for me, you know, because it's, uh, it's amazing how many there were. There must have been about 30 of them on me. And, uh. <laughs> um, when you were, like, about to join the military, like, mm -hmm. what were your feelings? Uh, it, at the time when I first joined the military, uh, my intentions was not to go straight to Vietnam. I had planned, when I signed up for the military, I signed up to, uh, they told me I could, have, I could go to school to be a t uh, nuclear technician, uh, which I thought would be a, 
a great opportunity. Uh, so I signed up for that. I signed up for four years in the military. Uh, about four months into my time there, after my basic training, uh, they informed me that they couldn't give me that particular school because I'm colorblind. And uh, to be a nuclear technician, you have to, because everything's color coded, the wiring and stuff like that. Uh, so they knocked a year off my time and sent me immediately to Vietnam. So that was sort of a surprise to me. <laughs> but did that happen to anyone else that you knew? Uh, not that I knew of, no. How did you feel on your way home? Uh, extremely happy. You know, really looking forward to seeing my family. Uh, did your, like you said your dad encouraged you to go to the military, but how did your mom feel? Uh, my mother was uh, totally against it. Totally against it. That's the last thing in the world she wanted to see. You know, and uh, which I understand. I understand being a parent. I, my children now are in their 40s, but you know, I I could imagine it would have been a very difficult time to see, especially during that period, to, to know where you're gonna, your child's going to end up or your child's going to end up in a war. It's got to be a, a very scary feeling. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I have uh, two brothers and a sister. And they didn't no, my uh, my younger brother joined the Navy, and uh, my sister, she didn't go in at the time. Uh, girls weren't joining joining the military that much. And my, my middle brother, he didn't join at all. He was, he was against it. How would you compare your feelings to when you first enlisted to when you left? Uh, I was very enthusiastic when I first enlisted. And uh, when I left, I was uh, probably a little jaded. Uh, you know, my thoughts were somewhat negative at the time. You've got to remember at that time, it's. Uh, Getting out of the military, it, it, wasn't, an, it wasn't an easy thing uh, because, I mean, when I got out, I didn't talk about it. Uh, just like your Uncle Kenny, your Uncle Kenny. Uh, that's when I first met him, was right after I got out of the military. Uh, you didn't talk to many people about it. You talked to another veteran, but most people didn't want to hear about it. They didn't want to know anything about it. It's, uh, Vietnam veterans really weren't accepted back then, uh, so so everybody sort of kept to themselves. Um, when did people start to like accept the Vietnam veterans and like did they go for it? Uh, it's because at, at some point the Vietnam veterans got tired of it, and they started forming their own organizations, and they started uh, getting out there, and not so much to have themselves recognized, but they, they knew that they needed to uh, make it better for future soldiers, you know, uh, which they have. Uh, and today when you see, like I mentioned earlier, when you see the soldiers come home, they have parades, uh, they're, they're welcome, and it's a wonderful thing. And that's how it should be. You know, these, these young kids put their lives on, their li on the line, and uh, you know, for them to come home and not be accepted. That's that's not right. That's not. It's a terrible thing. So. You said you had kids. Did yeah. you really tell them stories about your time in Vietnam? Not a whole lot. We, I, my youngest daughter, she used to ask me about it all the time, and uh, I would tell her a little bit, but I, I would never go into detail. It's, it's not necessary. War, war is not a glorified thing, and uh, you know everybody's well aware of what happens, and. Uh, but uh, we didn't talk that much about it. Like, how did the military experience like impact your life? Uh, the, the first few years, it was it. it I was very negative, uh, very withdrawn, uh, and it took probably a good ten to fifteen years before I sort of broke out of that mold that I that funk that I got myself into, uh, and told myself that it was okay. So, it, it was a negative impact, you know, after, after I was, got out, and, uh, which wasn't a good thing. But those days are over. Well, you were over there, did your friends, like, were they excited to be there, or like, were any of them drafted? You know? a, a lot of them were drafted, yeah, and uh, I would say most of, 
you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say that you were excited, but, you know, you were there to do a job, and you, the majority of the people, uh, did the best they could to do their job. There, naturally, there were a few that were, you know, bad apples. You know, they, uh, there's always one or two in the bunch that, you know, they just don't listen or, you know, uh, they get in trouble all the time. And that's anywhere you go. Did you make any, like, really good friends over there? At the time, yes. At the time, but like I said earlier, I've I've lost touch with, uh, and you know, you the thing is, you get on with your life, and you all go your own way, and little by little, you lose contact. When you all, when you were over, you said you got like a certain a little break where you went to Thailand. And mm -hmm. How long was that? It was only a week. You got a one week, like a one week vacation. How far was that? Like uh, I got on a plane. It was probably about a hour and a half ride by plane. And, uh, uh, just, uh, I was a tourist. You know, like I said, I, I rented a motorcycle and I traveled around uh, with the other, the, my other friend and we traveled around and uh, went to some of the tourist attractions at the time, uh, got to know the country. Uh, and it's a beautiful country. Uh, and then went back to Vietnam. You know, so it was pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, I was I was excited to get back to my base, get back to my unit. If you were asked to participate again, would you? In a minute. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yeah, I'd go in a flash. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do. You know, if this if this country was uh, being threatened in any way, I mean, I mean, I'm a little bit older now, but if this country's being threatened in any way, I, I would go in a minute. I wouldn't think twice about it. Is there anything that you miss about being overseas? Uh, not really. No, not at this point. You know, back that back then, I at one point I almost went back into the military because I, I missed I missed that uh, the action when I was much younger. Uh, but at this point in my life now, no, there's nothing that I miss. If one of your kids decided to join or enlist, would you like encourage them? Oh, absolutely. I, w I would support them 100%. Um, how'd you end up here on Cape Cod? Uh, well, when I was younger, I, I grew up in Detroit, but I was born in Worcester. And uh, when I was really young, I used to always come to Cape Cod. My family came to Cape Cod for vacations back in the 50s. And uh, when I got out, uh, and I had a good friend, good friend down here, my wife. And uh, when I got out of the service, I just came down here. And the rest is history. I've been down here about, about 48 years now, something like that. Um, what do you guys talk about at your meetings? Uh, basically, anything we want to any, anything we want to talk about. But every once in a while, uh, you know, we'll talk about uh, the impact that. Vietnam had on us. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the veterans have uh, PTSD. Uh, you know, so uh, there are certain things that come out every once in a while, uh, and so yeah, we discuss things like that. You know, just to uh, so that we understand better. Uh, it makes makes uh, makes it easy easier to deal with things. You know, sometimes uh, you might have difficulties. A lot of people have. Uh, you know, nightmares, and uh, they'll have a difficult time dealing with certain things. So, you know, I, uh, I have a counselor that I see uh, every few weeks, and it just makes things a little bit easier, you know, so that you can continue on. Um, have you really met any really good friends ever? No, no, not down here. No, mo most of the friends that I had are probably all over the country now. Yeah, really, the only uh, good friend that I have down here is Kenny, your uncle. When you were in Vietnam, did you like did you have surgeons that like or surgeons that like controlled you? Like? Oh, oh, sure, sure. You have a you have a, like a platoon leader, and he's the one that's in charge of. He might be in charge of six or eight guys underneath him. So, but then he's there's somebody above him who he has to answer to. It's a chain of command. 
So you start at the top with the, the captain or the major, and then it works its way down uh, you know, to the regular foot soldier, which is what I was. No, no, not while I was there. When you said you like kind of deactivated like the minefield bombs, did you ever like deactivate one yourself? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, well what would happen is uh, if we found uh, a mine buried, the mines today are much different than they are than they were then. Uh, but if we found one back then, uh, we would usually try to uncover it the best we could. And what we would usually do is we would set a charge on it. I always carried uh, uh, something called plastic explosive C4. And what we would do is we'd set up a charge on it and then <coughs> clear the area and then blow it in place. How long did that take? Oh, wouldn't take long at all. You know, 15, 20 minutes. Oh, what's the plastic? The C4, it's a, uh, it's, it's a plastic explosive. It it's, comes in a small bar. Uh, it's white, uh, and it's uh, it's very. I mean, you could drop it; and it's not going to blow up. You need uh, a blasting cap, uh, which is a, a, a like an ignition device that would uh, cause it to explode. I actually, or not just me, but a lot of people, uh, we used to eat sea rations while we were over there, which is uh, meals in a can. And what I would do is take a little piece of C4 break it off and you'd light it with a match. It wouldn't blow up, but you'd light it with a match and put it underneath the can to, just to heat up your meal. Uh, so it's, uh, it had a lot of uses. <laughs> Wait, did anyone ever get hurt like, while they were like, trying to deactivate the... Uh, nobody that I knew. Nobody. We were all pretty good at what we did. Did, anyone, like, did any of the enemies like, catch you trying to uh, deactivate? There, there were times we'd end up uh, in a firefight you know, because you, you, we would try to deactivate something, and then you'd receive uh, gunfire from the woods or the jungle at you, so everybody would be down. Do you have like people trying to like cover you, like while you were, if your group was like trying to deactivate the mine? Was like there other like people in combat like trying to like make sure no one was around? A absolutely, absolutely. You always had uh, you know a good sized group of people with you that would uh, create a perimeter, uh, you know, around you so that you could complete your job. Would you have done anything differently in any of the cases that you were in? No. No. You were? Uh, I feel that everything I did was uh, right, you know. I, I don't think I did anything wrong. I think every day, everything I did, uh, whether it was my decision or something that somebody asked me to do uh, was the correct thing to do. And to this day, I would, uh, I would do it again. I don't think anything was wrong. Did any of your friends like, ever not listen to the people who were in charge of them? Like, I, there were, yeah, there's, like I s mentioned earlier, there was always that, that few that would uh, cause a problem. Not too often. So you were the best? <laughs> I, I would like to think I was, yeah. No, no one ever tried to like, well did anyone ever try and like escape like from, if they were drafted, were there people who were trying to escape? There were, there were some people that went AWOL, that's absent without leave, uh, and uh, I knew one guy while I was over there, uh, he, went, he went on R&R, &R. Uh, I can't remember where he went, uh, but he never came back, and the last I heard when I was over there that he ended up in Sweden. And uh, Sweden at the time, and I think it still is, was a neutral country, but he had family in Sweden, uh, grandparents or something like that. And so he didn't want to be in the war anymore, and he just got on a plane and flew to Sweden and never came home. Now at that point you'd be considered a, a deserter, so which you could face uh, execution if you, you were caught or serious jail time. Did he get caught? I don't recall. I don't think so. I'm not sure. I, I've never heard anything after that, you know. You, like I said, you lose touch with these. So like, anyone know that AWOL you've never heard from again? Just disappeared? 
But there were a few people that dis just disappeared. And as far as I know, they went AWOL. There, and there were some people while we were in Vietnam that went AWOL in, or deserted, and uh, you never heard from them again. Whether they just went somewhere in the country, or did they die? No, no, nobody ever knew. You know, it's, Vietnam, there's a, I can't remember how many, but there's quite a few thousand men who are still missing, you know, over there. Uh, that never made it home, and they're considered MIA, missing in action. Uh, they could have been killed in action. Uh, they could have deserted. Yeah. So, I mean, it's probably about almost 3,000 men, I think. Okay. Um, thank you for taking your time to come. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Did you?